So I presume that people are joining. Uh, Kathy, can you tell us when, when it looks like we have um, uh, the population engaged? <laughs> Um, I think we're uh, pretty close right now. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to a panel discussion on Space Force, conversations about space power. Uh, my name is Anita Gale. I, um, I'm a, an aerospace engineer. I have over 40 years of experience in the space business. Uh, most of that was on the space shuttle program, and then I transitioned to Boeing commercial crew before I was retired. Um, and uh, I currently am uh, the CEO of the National Space Society, which we may talk about a little bit more later on, or at least reference to it. We have two very distinguished panelists. Uh, we have Namrata Gaswami and Peter Gerritsen, and we're going to do ladies first. I will ask each of them to introduce themselves. So Namrata, would you say a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you so much for having me on this panel on the Space Force and Space Power. So my name is Namrata Goswami. I have my own consultancy through which I study uh, international relations, space policy, uh, including those of the US, China, India, Japan, and Russia. And before that, I worked for about a decade in India's Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, looking at great power conflict, Asian security, and also what nations are doing in space. Very recently, I co-authored a book with uh, Peter Gerritsen on Scramble for the Skies, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space. And so looking forward to this uh, great conversation that we should be having. Thank you. All right, thank you. Peter, would you say a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, what I think would interest the audience is that uh, I, I currently am a senior fellow in defense studies for a think tank called American Foreign Policy Council. I retired out of a, a 28 year career with the Air Force where I was teaching at the Air Command and Staff College, a program in space strategy called the Schriever Scholars and the Space Horizons Task Force. And before that, I had uh, various advisory roles to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. And I was the Chief of Future Science and Technology for Air Force Strategic Planning. Uh, and as uh, uh, Dr. Goswami mentioned, she and I just recently published a book together, Scramble for the Skies, the Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space. And let's be clear, that's the United States Air Force. That's correct. For me, it was the United States Air Force. Good, good. Okay, we say the Air Force here in this country, but yeah, the US Air Force. Or US Air Force. Um, so uh, audience, I have a list of prepared questions that the, um, the two panelists have seen. And we will go through those. We may add some depending on what their answers are. You all are welcome to put, an, or put questions in the Q&A. So I will look as moderator at Q&A. We will address your questions after the prepared questions. So put, the, put your questions in at any time. And then I will look at them as after we're finished with that. We actually have 16 prepared questions. So, uh, and uh, I'm going to presume that um, Peter and Namrata can kind of take turns on who answers what. We only have two panelists, so we shouldn't be stepping all over each other. And we can kind of make hand signals too. Okay, so um, first question, just so everyone in our audience understands the role of the Space Force, the US Space Force, what functions were transitioned from other military services to the US Space Force? And what new functions are being established? Who wants to start? So let me start off. First of all, it's important uh, for the lay public to understand what a service is. So after a, a reform, a services provide, they organize, train, and equip, and then present forces to what are called combatant commands. And the combatant commands are directly responsible to the president and the secretary of defense to actually employ the forces and fight. So you may have also heard that we stood up a U.S. Space Command. But the Space Force itself is to build the, the widgets, to train the people, and to develop the methods for how they, they do things, right? And so they have a very broad mission to essentially defend America's interests in space. And what has been transferred was everything that previously belonged to the Air Force 
and they're in the process of transitioning a little bit of, uh, of what were the space communication capabilities of the Navy, and there's an ongoing battle as to what they will transfer from the Army. But in terms of what, the, what was the Air Force doing uh, that has become the Space Force in terms of its legacy roles, so every one of you that uses one of these little phones that is able to tell you where, where they are at any point in time, uh, the GPS constellation that gives you that, the timing for your ATMs, all that is operated by your Space Force and previously by the Air Force, Air Force Space Command. Also all the military uh, satellite communications for your nuclear command and control, uh, for, for uh, almost all of your military satellite communications, including the procurement of commercial satellite communications, uh, a limited amount of overhead sensing, most importantly, missile warning, uh, and uh, some very important weather things. And so what is emerging is also uh, capabilities to protect or to deny that, those same capabilities from others, and a great push to sort of uh, get with the commercial sector. So I don't know if I left anything out, uh, Amrata, did, anything you can think of that I missed? No, I think Peter, I think that you captured almost everything. So thank you. Okay. Uh, next question is kind of personal. My own first awareness of the need for a service that has become the United States Space Force was years ago. It was at a National Space Society conference about living in space, about space settlements. And there were two blue suitors there. One of them might have been Peter. And blue suitor is the industry speak for what US Air Force personnel are, because they their, the uniform is blue. <laughs> so we call them blue suitors. Um, and uh, two of them were there at, at this conference on space settlements. And I, I asked them, what interest does the Air Force have in future space settlements? And the answer was literally perfect. One of them said, we want to know what we will have to protect in the future. Uh, so what civilian and commercial interests in space are the Space Force preparing to protect? Well, let me start with a little bit of background that I think it may be instructive. So uh, I, I believe I probably was one of those blue suitors at the time. And in fact, you know, what, what many people uh, falsely think is that the Space Force is something that basically grew out of the last administration and the last president on a whim. In fact, it had been debated, you know, for decades of time. And in fact, among the perhaps seven loud voices that were pushing for a Space Force, at least four of them were National Space Society members. And the reason why they were pushing for it was because they foresaw an eventual large uh, commercial sphere in space to include space settlements. Now that is not the narrative that you will hear from those who were sort of dragged over into the Space Force. Um, you know, they will sort of tell a story that military satellites were at risk from China and Russia, but that was honestly already a problem. And in my view, the nation would not have taken such a big step uh, merely to reorganize for the threat. I think people both in Congress and in the White House uh, and, and our book, I think, chronicles it very well, um, really saw this as a long-term opportunity that you needed to have a Navy-like force to, to secure and protect uh, US commercial and settler interests in the long run. Now, as far as what are the Space Force currently, you know, their answer would be a, a, probably as little as possible, right? They, they feel very task saturated just taking an architecture that was built at, at a time when nobody was shooting at your satellites and you were not, uh, you didn't have to be concerned about resilience. You just had to be concerned that your satellites worked and having to adapt to the possibility that they might be targets and even go the step further that they might actually have to target somebody else's, right? So you can imagine culturally, if you've been brought up your entire time, you know, thinking of yourself as a support function to suddenly change roles into something, you know, very different. And in many ways, you know, a, a big mismatch between what the public and Congress might be expecting and what they think they've always been doing as well as what they're resourced for, right? 
So they recognize certainly that, that uh, commercial satellites are part of critical national infrastructure and that, uh, and that they are called upon at least selectively to start thinking about protecting those. Um, it, you know, what exactly that is, is not specified. And there's nothing yet in the, in the public talking points to suggest that the current Space Force leadership is giving any serious appraisal or has as planning assumptions the protection of future space settlements. Although in their official uh, Space Futures Workshop 2060 report, they specifically did call out the possibility of space settlements and the need to be able to protect them. So, you know, while it has not sort of reached the general officer level talking points, there are certainly some people within the service that have this long range vision. All right, Namrata, looks like you're ready to say something. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo, because I think it's important, one, that the uh, thinking about the Space Force, which I studied as part of the book project, is that uh, it's a long process. I think it came out of two important contexts. One was, as Peter was mentioning, there was this uh, thinking, as you mentioned, we need, we need to know the future, that there could be settlement, not just uh, Americans, but settlement from around the world that might have interplanetary presence. And because of that, we needed a military service that could not just uh, engage in conflict, but actually engage in activities like rescue operations, if something goes wrong, humanitarian missions, right? And so that kind of thinking actually played a very important role. I think the second context in terms of what the Space Force should be doing, if I may, in terms of settlements, for example, is uh, if you look at the policy documents that are actually coming out of the former administration and now President Biden has also supported the Artemis program, which is the lunar program to send uh, the first woman and the next person to the moon by 2024 and then sustainable presence by 2028. Now, if that is the goal that uh, the US space policy is thinking about, and that is uh, permanent presence, human presence on the lunar surface, that means that inevitably the military service have to come to the rescue of anything, if anything goes wrong uh, by extension, because after all, in a democracy, the military exists to serve civilian uh, agencies. And so I think in that context, what I foresee is that the Space Force starting in a very limited manner, and that is uh, support of uh, hardening satellites, securing satellites vis-a-vis -vis, uh, competitors, will be starting to think about such, such missions that would be on their table. And so that's something I thought uh, should be, something that should interest the audience here. Thank you. Cool. I remember some of those early discussions among leaders in National Space Society about what, what now is the Space Force. And a lot of us wanted to call it the Space Guard, like the Coast Guard, uh, to, to more, to, to define the role a little bit more peacefully than force sounds like. I'm going to depart from the intention here. We have a question that actually is appropriate for what we were just discussing. Uh, so we have a question. Do you think there is a more secret reason the Space Force was activated, uh, maybe due to first contact of alien, alien forces? Any opinions on that? Yeah, um, you know, while I certainly would be open to discussing, you know, that, that topic, I have to say that I, I think I'm pretty much an insider on the creation of the Space Force. And that was not one of the reasons uh, that I or any of the other advocates or any of the folks talking about it, um, you know, uh, seem to uh, to have. And in fact, you know, although you can find certainly some Pentagon interest in these on, in the UAP task force, I, I have not found any of that interest inside the Space Force itself. Um, so I, re regrettably, no, I don't think we have any big reveal coming. Uh, it was, it's pretty mundane. You know, one of the things that sort of neither uh, myself or, or Namrata brought up was that uh, certainly, you know, it, 
China's move to have their own space force, their strategic support force, and their aggressive actions uh, to, you know, build anti-satellite weapons really woke up a lot of people uh, to the thought that we needed to be moving faster, to be organized better for space. Uh, and everybody was looking for some level of solution. A lot of it was really on the acquisition solution, on moving faster. Uh, but most of the people who were most concerned about that problem were, were really not the strong independent Space Force advocates. Those, the, the people who were pushing for an independent Space Force weren't motivated by concern that, that we had first contact with aliens. We were concerned that we weren't postured and organized in the right way to be able to access and secure the vast wealth and opportunity in space. Namrata, you have anything to add? Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add is uh, since I study China uh, as part of my research uh, project, uh, it's a very interesting question actually, because if, if you have read one of the most famous science fiction that has come out of China, which is Lu Shixing's Dark Forest. So in that book, uh, he basically uh, points out, and it's of course a fictional uh, universe where because of alien contact, uh, China establishes a space force. So it's very interesting. But in, in the context of today and the reality, even if you look at how China established the space force, because China was the first country to establish a separate service in 2015 and the US followed, it was because of the fact that there was a sudden realization that space played a very critical role in military command and control security of uh, commercial assets, which we were talking about. The fact that commercial satellite industry is returning about $500 billion annually, which means you have to secure those services. So those are the reasons where President Xi guided the establishment of the Space Force. And of course, as Peter mentioned, the uh, subsequent years since the establishment of the PLA Strategic Support Force in 2015, I think US intelligence woke up to the fact that they had improved their uh, anti-satellite weaponry, direct ascent, uh, jamming, blinding of satellites, which made U US satellites vulnerable. And so I think those were the contacts why you then subsequently had the establishment of a space force. And actually talking about Chinese activities in space leads to the next question. Space debris is a big issue or really a collection of issues involving hazards, responsibilities, salvage rights, and even identifying ownership of, of derelict satellites. How does the space force expect to get involved with space debris issues? All right, so this is a complicated question, but uh, right now, uh, and this is actually important for you as attendees because one of the, th I imagine that some of you probably are uh, international, but probably most of you are US citizens and as US citizens, you are voters. And the Space Force doesn't just do what it wants, it does what the American people tell it to do. And right now there's a, there's a, a cultural war inside the Space Force, a war for the soul of what the Space Force will become. And, you know, uh, Anita hinted at part of it when she talked about, you know, the name and the Space Guard versus Space Force. And part of this is, whether or not you think the philosophically, you know, do you subscribe to a philosophy that the Space Force should have a very limited scope and mandate, that essentially its only job is to support the joint forces and to protect military satellites, or do you think that it ought to have a larger role that would include more Coast Guard-like missions that might be, as, as Namrata mentioned, search and rescue, that might, I think there's a question later, uh, you know, on asteroid defense, on active debris removal, right? So those folks who favor the broad mandate of a much more expansive, more Starfleet-like mission set for the Space Force, um, you know, look at, at this as a tremendous opportunity. It's an opportunity to practice, to demonstrate your skill, to demonstrate your skill in public such that it has a certain level of deterrence value. Uh, but, it, uh, but it lessens the burden because you're providing a global public good. The other school of thought, that, the school of thought that I just talked about would be what's called the colloquially the blue water school, meaning 
like a navy that goes out into the deep blue ocean to cross continents, you would have a space force that is there to cross out to the moon and even beyond. The, the, the converse is the brown water. So instead of looking out, you're looking down, you wanna push away all those missions, say, oh, that should be somebody else. I don't know who, NASA, Commerce, FAA, anybody but me, just don't give me another unfunded mandate, right? So, uh, so you see this war between sort of the empire builders that want to create this very expansive Starfleet and, uh, and the brown water folks that, that, that want to limit the number of things on their to-do list. So, uh, you know, the, the blue water folks are winning the narrative external to the Space Force. The brown water folks securely hold the culture inside the bureaucracy itself. So at the moment, you know, I think that the Space Force is not uh, anxious to get into this because they're worried it will be a job that they will be saddled with uh, that, that distracts from their core warfighting uh, mission. And I don't know what the, what Nami thinks about that. Uh, okay, go for it. Yeah, <laughs> thank so, you. Do something. <laughs> well, I think that question is critical because uh, first of all, you have a, a present and a future where you will have a company like SpaceX that plans to launch about thirty thousand satellites to low Earth orbit. You have the uh, China National Space Administration register with the International Telecommunication Union talking about launching about 12,992 satellites to low Earth orbit. And in a context where satellites get derelict, as we were mentioning, or create debris, uh, who will clean that up? We, do we have companies that are developing the capability to clean up such uh, satellites? We are not yet in that conversation. The second important issue in terms of who is going to enforce, so for example, you hold a country responsible for a particular debris it created. For example, the Chinese ASAT test in 2007 that created debris. Now, who is responsible? Now, even if you hold someone responsible, who is going to enforce that particular legal responsibility? Will it be the US Space Force? Will it be a combination of space forces? You do need someone to uh, ensure someone is whole legally responsible. I don't think we have that kind of entity as yet. And I haven't seen in at least the strategic conversations coming out of the US Space Force that when they talk about the importance of uh, ensuring that debris is not created or they track debris. So they think that's their role to track pieces. But uh, I haven't seen a conversation where they have assumed that international responsibility. After all, any such international responsibility have to be mandated by the United Nations Office on Outer Space Affairs and based on the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and the subsequent conventions that we have of liability, which is 1972. Uh, we are not there yet, but I see a future because of these many launches that it will become an important policy issue. So I'd just like to follow up on that. You know, there are a few other things to consider here. You know. In some sense, the Space Force's preferences may ultimately not matter a lot. Because if you think about it, the Space Force is likely to be the only government arm in the near term that has that will have significant inspection and perhaps rendezvous that might actually be able to do something about space debris. And you know, when you've got billionaires that may be important to various elections that have you know, things that they may need help with. And the only arm of the US government that's capable of doing it is the US Space Force. They, they could very well be directed, you know, to do that. You know, they may be deputized in a way to do that. Now, you know, when my team had originally written, you know, the language we wanted for the US Space Force, we, we did not want it as to be part of the US Air Force. We wanted it to be its own separate department so that there was no question about the passe comitatus about the ability of the Space Force to do law enforcement missions, uh, you know, directly. Uh, you know, right now it probably would have to be, you know, uh, defense support to civilian authorities to do some of these things. And they require this to kind of a ridiculously, you know, long uh, chain of uh, approvals uh, 
But it is something that I think we're ha gonna have to consider because I just don't see the, the appetite of the American public to recreate the same kind of space control capabilities in the Department of Commerce or somewhere else that they've paid for and are just sitting idle, you know, waiting for a war that hopefully if it's deterrent enough won't happen. Okay, uh, go on to the next question. So. Uh, we joke that the reason the dinosaurs went extinct is because they didn't have a space program when the asteroid hit, that famous, infamous asteroid 65 million years ago. We expect, expect there are other asteroids out there that pose threats for Earth. There have been some near misses that get into the news. Is the Space Force involved in looking at how to mitigate threats from asteroid impacts on Earth? Either of you. <laughs> So, you know, the, the good answer is yes. So, you know, Air Force Space Command that has now become the Space Force operates PanStar, you know, what is a, is a big component of PanStars, which is one of the ways in which we find these things. They also keep track of the bolide strikes. But the, part of the problem is, is despite a law written by Congress several years ago, you know, asking the president to, you know, decide who would be in charge of deflecting asteroids. Three or four administrations now have punted and not done anything, you know, with that. And neither has Congress specified whose responsibility this is. So it sits in a no man's land. In my view, it's absolutely clear it should be the Space Force's job. Uh, but the Space Force, unfortunately, uh, as I said, it is not. Uh, the Empire Builders and the Starfleet Builders are, are, have not captured the inside. Uh, you know, so those inside are, again, trying to push away any unfunded mandate, anything that they consider to be not a core warfighting mission. Despite that, uh, so you, know, you don't see the Space Force leadership arguing that they should have this to Congress. But on the bright side, they have at least written uh, memorandums of, uh, of understanding with NASA to start cooperating on planetary defense sensing. And you see the same thing also between uh, uh, NASA and the Department of Energy and the US Space Command and NASA. So luckily we are much further along and it's no longer in the giggle factor, uh, but, but we, we are not fortunate enough to have a strong advocate of planetary defense you know, at the apex of our military organizations. Anything to add, Namrata? <laughs> uh, I think Peter's captured it well, but just one thing I would add is that if you look at the Space Force uh, Space Power Doctrine, which is also a part of the panel conversation, so the definition of space power is that you have the capacity to not just have control of space or access to space, but that you have good space situational awareness, SSA. So in that context, I would assume it's a logical extension that planetary defense, especially defense uh, for an incoming asteroid so that we do not face what happened 65 million years ago because we have a space program, um, should be a logical part of the Space Force's mission. And uh, what that entails uh, is not just tracking in cooperation with NASA, but also what happens if an asteroid actually, God forbid, uh, is in collision course. Do we have a capacity to deflect it uh, by technological means? Are we investing in such a capacity? Who should be in charge of that? I think those are critical questions for the future of humanity. And uh, given the fact that space situational awareness is part of their mission, I would assume that it should include uh, planetary defense as well. And just to you know, piggyback on that, you know, unfortunately, you know, it is not what is called a specified mission where that you just can't wiggle out of it. There are so many documents in different places that make it an implied mission. And it, you know, I just can't imagine that if we actually had an asteroid that a small one that struck or a large one, you know, that the American people wouldn't just consider dereliction of duty for the Space Force not to have been on top of it or not to be on top of it. And, you know, the other thing I would say is well, NASA has many important competencies that can be contributing to this. It is clearly a defense mission and it requires defense type of you know, materials. 
impactors fusing, potentially the use of nuclear explosives. And as Namrata said, you know, they are certainly directly tasked with space situational awareness for homeland defense. Another factor can be uh, a large asteroid hit is an international concern. Uh, should the United States be the only uh, responsible party for trying to mitigate it, or is, should this be a, re a shared responsibility? I don't know if either of you wants to address that. Yeah, so that's a great question, Anita, because uh, the former president of India, Abdul Kalam, who talked about, who also was invited by the National Space Society to speak about the future of space and space-based solar power, pointed out that in the future, it is important for nations to collaborate in certain issues, especially planetary defense. Because as you mentioned, uh, asteroid hit impacts almost the whole planet, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that context, uh, it should be an international issue, but it also means that those nations with spacefaring capacity and high-end technology should actually be able to come together in that, in that particular context. There are conversations in terms of scientists talking to each other, uh, which I know of, in terms of uh, space agencies talking about the issue. China has actually a special unit in the China Academy of Sciences that deals with planetary defense. Uh, and unlike NASA, the Chinese space program is directed by the People's Liberation Army. So it's under military direction. And so they do identify planetary defense as an important uh, you know, activity. So I think the one body that should be looking at it even more seriously is of course the United Nations Office on Outer Space Affairs, since these are life-threatening life issues if you think about it from a historical point of view. Well, you know, the United States doesn't do anything uh, by itself. And, you know, for the most part, it tries to do everything uh, with allies. And I think, you know, something like this would definitely come up in the Security Council. And in fact, there's already a very strong uh, attempt by the Association for Space Explorers to come up with protocols for international cooperation. And one of the things that, you know, uh, people may or may not be aware of is just how much cooperation the, the US military does. And a huge amount of uh, the military's effort is in some type of active diplomacy and partnering. And that's not just with our allies. Uh, you know, for example, you know, we had some of the most interesting exchanges uh, between the United States Strategic Command and its subordinate components like DITRA and MDA uh, you know, with Russia, you know, discussing, you know, the asteroid problem about, you know, what were their nuclear weapons capable of, what were our nuclear weapons, what are their space vehicles capable of. And in fact, you know, in terms of like day-to-day operational communications, I mean, like, you know, the, the red phone type of things, the communications between the military and other militaries is very strong. And if we were going to be collaborating with China and deflecting an asteroid or Russia or India, very likely uh, in all those cases, there were, those countries would bring a strong military component, particularly if it was large uh, and large enough that it required nuclear explosives. Okay, let's go to another one. Um, space lawyers have been arguing about property rights in space for years. And I personally have been witnessing this for at least 30 or 40 years. For commercial entities to survive or to thrive anywhere, they need to know that companies own what they build and operate. How do you see property rights developing and perhaps evolving in space, particularly on the moon and asteroids? Peter, if I may, uh, I can answer. And so I think this is actually the issue of the day because unlike the Cold War today, the uh, notion of space has changed. So during the Cold War, space was a lot about uh, prestige and reputation, going somewhere first, uh, being able to demonstrate a particular technology like uh, Sputnik in 1957, the first man human made uh, satellite, and then the landing of humans on the moon in 1969. But none of those resulted, especially going to the moon, did not result in a long term presence or the idea that you could have uh, mining of lunar resources. Today, when you listen to the conversations 
coming out of China, uh, Luxembourg, the United Arab Emirates, Australia. There is a lot of conversation about how space also has the benefit of economic return. So space is no more seen as just a prestige or reputation mission conducted by a few countries, uh, but it has become an enterprise where you have the African Union now establishing an African space agency. You have new space agencies being established almost every year because space is about economic benefits. So in that context, uh, the Outer Space Treaty that was signed and uh, ratified by about 110 countries dealt with a reality in 1967 where states were the main actors. Mm -hmm. So given that they did not talk a lot about property rights, commercial actors. And so today there, you, you have laws like the US uh, Commercial Launch, Space Launch Activities Act that tells you that a uh, US citizen, if it gets to a place somewhere in space, has entitlement to the resources that it has mined, for example. Uh, you have laws coming out of Luxembourg, for example, the space mining law that tells you that any commercial entity that establishes or registers in Luxembourg can utilize the Luxembourg law and can have uh, you know, uh, entitlement to that particular resource. But there is a challenge. And the challenge is that this is not recognized by all nations. And because this is not recognized, you also have the other conversation which happens with regard to property right. For example, uh, if you listen to the head of China's uh, lunar exploration program, China has one of the most advanced lunar program today, the only country to have presence on the lunar far side with the longest rover, which is active. And that rover, the Chang'e 4, has a radar that is actually prospecting the far side as we speak for resources. Some of the resources they're hoping to find are like helium-3, uh, iron ore, titanium. And the idea is that once you have an idea where it is, you should develop extraction capability. Now in the Chinese conception, in regard to property right, it's about first come first serve. So if you are somewhere first, you have an entitlement. And so in that, and so that is why it's a challenge because you have a space governance regime that is very much dictated by the 1960s legal mindset which in which states were the main actors and the biggest fear was to ensure that you did not have weapons of mass destruction in space it was not about property rights today that is the issue and so uh there is still as you mentioned space lawyers talking about this but there is also the context that if some country goes there first and is able to establish a particular base they do think that they have entitlement and that is where concerns arise uh peter uh you. So, you know, I think that right now we're seeing a, uh, enough of a consensus around spacefaring and space finance capable actors who want to interpret the Outer Space Treaty in a way that enables at least some form of property rights. Now, when I say property rights, I don't mean what the Outer Space Treaty specifically prohibits, which is the long-term ownership of real estate, right? That, that uh, and as sovereign owned territory of a nation is prohibited. Now, the Outer Space Treaty could like other treaties fail, but right now I don't see the appetite uh, of, the, of any of the powers to, to cause it to fail. So there's a second you know, idea in, in, uh, in the institutional literature that essentially property you know, is about specifying what you have the rights to use privately to dispose of as you wish. And so you know, here we've already seen an evolution where now it appears uh, you know, a, uh, an interpretation that you can remove parts of a celestial body and own and sell and you know, very likely it appears through the Artemis Accords that probably some type of a safety zone or facility you know, is going to become a norm that is likely to be respected. Now, the only way that you can, in ungoverned spaces, uh, you know, people will do what they perceive they can get away with and is in their interests. And that's why, you know, you, you just have to have something like a Space Force uh, 
Now, Space Force, you know, does not have authority over somebody else, uh, but it can harm them. Uh, and it can threaten a crisis, uh, and not just ours, you know, the, the Chinese Space Force can do the same. You know, if our settlers, you know, were to get out of line and, you know, start, you know, poaching on their, you know, water field. Um, and you could have the same thing between two U.S. entities, right? So it, it's just not a good formula to not have some type of enforcement. And enforcement in this is not, you know, just keeping somebody apart. You know, it's threatening the other with harm. And that may be uncomfortable, but this is how the United States Navy protects shipping on the sea. It doesn't cozy up to every merchant vessel and follow them, you know, and get in the way of somebody launching a missile. It's there and people know that if they were to hurt a US ship, that that Navy ship can shoot guns or launch missiles at them. And that fear is what, what allows safe and open commerce to take place. Wow. Namrata, have anything to add on that one? No, I think Peter uh, covered it very well. Okay. Uh, next question is related. Does the Space Force foresee a role for helping protect property rights in space? So, you know, again, the question is who? The looking out folks or the looking down folks? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the looking out folks, I think, think this is so obvious. You know, why do you even have to ask? Of course, if the United States is going to develop uh, you know, eventually significant financial and economic resources and strategic locations that matters to it, it will need a space force that is out there protecting it. Uh, the, the looking down, you know, brown water folks are, are very skeptical that we will ever have, uh, you know, anything of significance beyond geostationary orbit. I don't think they take seriously the, the, uh, the visions of uh, Bezos and Musk, and in fact, of interest to your specific community in sci-fi, they're actively trying to crush and make sure that there's no association anywhere. You know, they're they're uh, you know they seem to be mostly concerned with not being teased by football players. Uh, you know, rather than to you know embrace you know the uh, the power of pop culture and science fiction. And I'll post in the uh, in the chat, you know, uh, one of the essays that is counseling the Space Force leadership to disavow science fiction. Wow, <laughs> Narada, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, so it, in terms of your question, uh, is will the Space Force come to the, uh, will, will it protect property rights? So I think it's a tricky legal question because first of all, in the Outer Space Treaty, property rights uh, are not specifically uh, allowed because of the national sovereignty issue. But then if you come to a specific policy direction, so the US Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act that was signed, it was a bipartisan uh, legislation signed into law by President Obama, basically has a section that says that the US is the sense of Congress that the US De Defense Department should come to the rescue of American citizens in case something goes wrong. For example, if not property, but in case they are having a mining base on the moon and that they're engaging in some kind of activity uh, and, and that particular company is launched from the United States as an American company, then obviously they're American citizens. And so the sense of Congress is that the US Defense Department, which means the US Space Force, which is the one that will have space situational awareness and uh, space command and control will have to come to the rescue. So it might not be directly in the support of property rights, but it would definitely be called upon if you look at the legal language in, the, uh, in that particular act of 2015, it, it will have to come to the rescue of the citizens if they are threatened. In, in the economic activity that they're doing. And what is interesting is that in that particular legislation, it also says that American citizens have the right to uh, the resources that they have extracted. So, which means if something is, they're not allowed to do it, 
somebody has to come to their rescue. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's tricky, but you do have answers uh, from legislation that tell you what the situation could be. Okay, thank you. Next question. Presuming that the habitation of space may proceed much like the settling of the American West, it's not a stretch to imagine that early space operations will resemble a collection of company towns, mining camps, and military forts. Is the Space Force looking at how and where the space equivalent of frontier forts will be established? Well, Lee, I think that <clears throat> sort of depends on, uh, on what time frame you're thinking about and who you include when you say the Space Force. If, you, if you're asking, you know, the, does the apex leadership of the Space Force and their immediate, you know, hardcore planning team for the next, you know, they're, they're focused on the next two to five, maybe 15 years. Um, and I don't think that there's much thought being given to this. Now, if you include military academia, you know, who's coming through the schools, who are the professors, what are they thinking about? Absolutely. There's a lot of thought uh, being, you know, given, you know, to this, and has been for a while, um, and it's sort of, the, you know, right now I would say that the space force leadership has been very loud about pouring cold water on any expectation that they think they'll have uh, any people in the space force in space at, at any time. Hmm. Um, now, many external, you know, observers just think that's crazy and not, not uh, long-sighted enough. And part of it is sort of where your focus is, right? I mean, I think probably I would agree that in the next five years, you're not going to have, you know, significant space force. You're, you're not going to have a need for, you know, human beings to perform the missions that are in front of them. But, you know, as, at, you know, assuming that such settlement does go forward, and that is part of my planning assumptions. I think you're right. I think you'll see company towns and mining camps, and you will see military forts. And I think it'll look silly for all of those to be uh, in, entirely unmanned. I think that you know, if you have significant numbers of citizens, it will be natural to expect that some of those citizens will be uniformed in order to keep a presence and, and interact directly. Um, but the, but the larger question I think here goes back to my earlier comment about ungoverned spaces. So what you don't want to have happen are company towns that, that feel beyond the jurisdiction. It, you, you don't want US company towns that feel like they are beyond the jurisdiction of the US constitution and don't have to respect human rights or are beyond the jurisdiction of the United Nations in general and its requirements uh, in the, the Universal Declaration of, of the, the Rights of Human Beings. So, uh, and that's where, again, you know, whether or not it's contraband or it's smuggling, you know, or in the long run, it, you know, all the bad things that you see, smuggling, prostitution, you know, uh, human trafficking, slave labor. It, it, if you want a future that is devoid of those evils, you're gonna to have to have some kind of a sheriff. And in early undeveloped spaces, right, the, the sheriff is usually, you know, the military in some manner. Yeah, I think uh, if, to answer your question, I don't think the Space Force as it is constituted today is thinking about uh, a similar kind of role that the military, US military had in opening up the frontier, especially the West. Uh, including survey functions that were conducted uh, and also opening up this land for uh, settlement. Uh, at this point of time, the US Space Force, as it is constituted, and if you look at their space power doctrine, they see themselves a lot like a service that is mostly about guaranteeing satellites, which is the uh, command control communication navigation. Uh, for military purposes, and they see themselves as a service that is mostly in support of the joint function of warfare uh, for the Navy to the Army Air Force. So uh, now is that required if, as I said, so if you have a future where you have, say, American companies settling 
say on Mars, let's take an example on Mars. For example, uh, Elon Musk from SpaceX talks about establishing a city on Mars. Uh, in that context, will it be then required? I think policy changes, especially institutional change, including the establishment of the Space Force did not come from the military. It came from outside external pressure, civilian pressure, for example, Mike Rogers, uh, representative of Alabama and Jim Cooper, Democrat from Tennessee, they saw the requirement for the Space Force and so uh, basically took the conversation that was happening and created a pressure point. So similarly, when the Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act was passed, it was because private companies wanted a certainty, as you were mentioning. I would say that once you have uh, American commercial uh, entities or citizens establishing some kind of uh, uh, settlement area, there would be pressure then. Uh, and as I said, the military is a very uh, rigid function, institutional culture, does not like changes often and would not want it to make these changes on itself. But because of outside pressure, uh, there will be, there will be policy changes in that context. Okay, and, uh, by the way, I'd like to thank Peter, uh, for those of you who are putting questions in the, um... Uh, in the Q&A, uh, Peter's been answering them, so we're, we're not bringing them up verbally because Peter's been um, very judiciously answering questions, so thank you. Okay, um, next one. Uh, how do you expect the Space Force will interact with early commercial and or private habitats in space? So we're presuming people will live in space. Originally, probably small commercial and who knows, maybe tourist trap habitats, but uh, how might the Space Force interact with those habitats? Well, first of all, I'd say that if the Space Force culture continues on its current track, they're going to have a harder time adjusting to this reality. <laughs> They'll be slow and flat-footed and, you know, it'll be sort of the, the you know, deer, deer caught in the headlights look of what, what me? Um, but, you know, uh, but that could change, you know, as, as you know, as they get their feet under them and realize that they're truly their own service, you know, that service is an entire domain of vast opportunity and there's much more than just, you know, defending military satellites. Uh, or, you know, even if they had to, you know, do this in a catch-up position, you know, what you'll see is, you know, they're, they're, we, we have a, uh, a colleague, Josh Carlson, who's written a book called Space Power Senate, where he lays out this sort of four phases of explore, expand, exploit, and exclude. Mm -hmm. And you know, so what what a what a space force that was a true leader would do is, you know, they would help lead in exploration. And then they would help lead in expansion by deliberately putting forts in places that help bring up and support company towns. And those those places become important long before they are actually economically productive. So an example is in the new world, you know, we had France and, and uh, Great Britain, uh, you know, vying for control of North America and putting down these tiny colonies that were nowhere close yet to being self-sufficient. And they were being attacked as they're being put down, right? To try to exclude, you know, the other, you know, from them. And that was not, and they were defending those not because they were themselves significant, you know, uh, economic interests, but they were expected over time to become, a, you know, significant interests. And so as a result, they were protecting their, what they saw to be their future interests and their future strategic, you know, locations. So I think, you know, the Space Force, you know, it, if it's truly going to help, you know, lead the United States is going to play a role in expansion and, and protecting you know, strategic locations as we move out. And then they will really be the only you know, large reservoir. Typically, militaries have a lot of logistics capability. You know, they have medical capability. You know, they are just a ready reserve of strength you know, to, to deal with anything, whether it is natural hazards, you know, for example, on Earth, we regularly use our Air Force to do non-combatant evacuations of places that are either, you know, expected to have a disaster or having some kind of political problem. 
you know, we protect colonies of others that switch sides and want to come over, you know, to us. We go and rescue individual citizens that have gotten lost. We help derelict vessels. Um, we bring emergency supplies. You know, we will go, for instance, you know, to Africa to inoculate for Ebola. So all these same sorts of roles that you see for terrestrial militaries are likely, in my view, to repeat if we are successful in, in colonization beyond Earth. Anything to add, Namrata? No, I think we should, we can go ahead to the next question. Okay. Um, you kind of mentioned this. Uh, do we know if other nations are planning to establish military branches like the US Space Force? Uh, yes, they are. So as I mentioned before, uh, the first country to actually uh, establish it was uh, China. Uh, so they established uh, the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force as an independent service uh, in 2015. Uh, this was, of course, followed by the US uh, in 2019 when they established their own uh, strategic support, space force. Uh, Japan has also established a space domain unit, which is their space force within the Article 9 of the Constitution of Japan, which is very restrictive. So it's called the space, it's called the space domain unit, which is for defensive purposes, not for offensive purposes. You have India that is talking about establishing a defense space agency. Uh, India recently also uh, tested an ASAT weapon, an anti-satellite weapon uh, in 2019. You have France that has established a space force. Uh, and so you can see that because the context of space has changed, uh, countries are starting to rise up to not just the implications in terms of military or weaponization, but also the critical uh, economic return. And so this is why they are, and that's why space power as a concept becomes very important. So space power is not just uh, military power, but also economic power. And so the rationale given is that because space is a critical infrastructure, uh, it all of us depend on space today, uh, including as Peter was mentioning, uh, global positioning service, uh, GPS, uh, which many uh, industries depend on. So countries are actually starting to establish their own uh, military institutional structure. Uh, and in fact, there are other countries. Australia is now, uh, at least the Australian strategic community has come out and advised the Australian government. One of the colleagues that write on this, Dr. Malcolm Davis, has talked about uh, Australia establishing a space force as well. So there are, there are conversations as we speak. All right, Peter, anything to add on that? muted. No, I think we can go on to the next question. Okay. So uh, given that there are other nations establishing space forces, how do you expect the US Space Force would interact with similar military branches established by other countries? Okay, so I think there are, you know, two basic uh, templates for this. One is with deeply friendly countries who are allies or, or part of a collective defense society and the other is with uh with you know other powers and in both cases i think it's actually likely to be a pretty optimistic uh, scenario so it is a reality that wars punctuate our uh, uh our largely civilian and commercial discourse uh, but for the most part, militaries do a really good job even enemy militaries adversary militaries do a really good job cooperating for the most part, you know, we cooperate against piracy to rescue folks, you know, to, to move things back and forth, you know, navies on the ocean, you know, even adversaries are, are able to cooperate most of the time. And as far as like the Space Force is actually remarkably uh, uh, engaged in interacting with its sister services in, in, uh, in other nations. So, the, the war games that we play uh, have involved a large number of very familiar allies. Uh, and I believe even India uh, was a, uh, a player in the last uh, Schreiber war game. Certainly Japan, uh, the UK, Netherlands, uh, Germany uh, have been uh, regular participants. And there are, I think, somewhere on the order of seven countries uh, 
I think, that are part of the Combined Space Operations Center. They're actually part of our day-to-day -day operations. And we do regular training uh, of our uh, of friendly nations as well. And that, you know, doesn't even touch all the space situational awareness agreements that exist between the US Space Force and other friendly countries. Uh, and then there are, you know, dialogues that happen, you know, uh, on the defense side about concerns that we have in order to try to establish rules of the road and expectations. And you'll hear, you have heard, and you will continue to hear from this administration and from this Space Force leadership, their desire to establish rules of the road with other space powers and space forces to prevent inadvertent escalation. And what they are really talking about here is it's uncomfortable when somebody brings their satellite close to your billion dollar satellite. Uh, it's very uncomfortable. Uh, you don't know if they're going to attack or they're just coming to look. And even if they're coming to look, you're not entirely you know, sure that they're not gonna mess things up. Um, and you uh, don't like them interfering with the signals and you don't like them interfering with your business uh, and they don't like it either. Uh, and so, you know, right now, you know, this is unsettled, uh, unsettled norms as to how close you can get to somebody else's satellite without it being considered a hostile act, you know, or, you know, what might be considered an uh, you know, a, a use of force or an act of war. Uh, I think I think Peter's uh, covered it well. We can move to the next question. Okay. Um, so we in the National Space Society expect that eventually people will build large space settlements where thousands of people can live in space. How those settlements will govern themselves or be governed has been a topic of debate for years. What are your thoughts on governing of, or governance of large human settlements in space? And it's okay to say I haven't thought about it. <laughs> well, actually I, I have put a bit of thought on that. And uh, one of the reason why I am interested in that is because I also study political culture as part of my research work. And so uh, there are two scenarios I see happening. One is that you have large settlers, the National Space Society envisions, and I've read the mission documents, so uh, that there will be thousands of people living in space, working in space, starting families in space, like we have on Earth. Now, will it continue to be governed by the kind of political systems we have on Earth? Will depend on where those citizens come from. So for example, if you have uh, citizens that have traced their uh, you know, path to democratic political culture, uh, for example, say in India or the US or uh, Germany, it is very likely that they might continue. I wouldn't say it's a given, but they might continue with a very similar kind of governance structure where you have representative government. It could be presidential, it could be parliamentary, it could be direct democracy. I think Musk uh, tweeted that in his structure, they will have direct democracy. So citizens will have a very direct say, unlike in the US where representatives represent your views, right? So it'll be more like Switzerland where you have direct democracy. Now it could also be the case that you have a settlement of thousands of people coming from authoritarian regimes where you have one party systems. Now, will they actually want to become more democratic? We don't know, right? It could be that they will establish very one party authoritarian systems thinking that that's the better way to go, to bring consensus, because democracies take a long time in terms of consensus. And so now the, the second scenario is that the settlements, because of their distance from Earth, might actually break away and form their completely different political culture and identity. And in fact, uh, the children who are born in this uh, far away settlements might not feel affinity to Earth. And this happens to my grandchildren as well, right? The parents who are actually from a particular country feels a lot of tug to, for their home country, but those who are born in, a, in the land that they migrated to do not have the same level of connection. Uh, I think one, your audience might be interested in one of the very interesting science fiction series I have watched called The Expanse that deals with that kind of scenario where you have the belters, you have the Martians and you have the earthers 
and all of them have, feel very different identity tugs. So it's a very interesting question to contemplate on. Another factor is when, uh, when there's a threat approaching your space settlement or there's a hole, there's a breach in the hull and you're losing your air, you can't wait for a democratic government to decide, hey, we're gonna patch the hole. <laughs> so you might need a captain for that sort of thing. <laughs> hey, Peter, you have something to add? <laughs> Yes. So, you know, it, there, there's more than one ways I could take your question. You know, one is what form might the internal governance of these take? And I share the concerns of some like Dan Dudney, you know, that the ship-like quality, you know, could tend towards at least some level of autocracy for some things. On the other hand, the tremendous diversity that it could offer seems like it would offer, you know, a much broader, you know, realm of experimentation and the possibility of moving between them. Uh, so I tend to think that, you know, if, if it isn't a direct safety issue, you know, you certainly will have the space for certain types of libertarian communities. Um, though I would also expect that you're going to have your little Jones towns and you know uh, and religious cults that are going to you know choose what they do. But the second way I could take your question is independence or continued uh, uh, tethering to the home world. And in that, I think that certainly before they are self-sufficient uh, or at least mostly self-sufficient. I think they will, you know, be tethered to the home world. And I think home worlds will be very protective. You could imagine a situation like in our own colonies where we broke off and France recognized us. I could imagine, you know, uh, Namrat and I were just talking about this yesterday that, you know, you could imagine, you know, that if the United States was unwilling to grant certain liberties, maybe the SpaceX colony would just defect and China might recognize them, right? I think that's unlikely. I think the more likely situation is that China, you know, uh, Chinese citizens might not like being treated and might choose to be independent. Uh, and, you know, that might be on religious grounds, that might be on privacy grounds, uh, you know, but you might see the United States be willing to accept that. And, you know, I, I cannot imagine that in the long run, the, you know, we would not find a reconciliation between the Outer Space Treaty and the Universal Declaration on the Rights uh, on, on Human Rights. So, you know, in that, self governance and the right to property and the right to move where you want to move are essential human rights. And I don't think you can deny them just because the Outer Space Treaty says, you know, you can't own property uh, or you, you can't, nations can't own property. So I think at some point we will see you know, nations in space, whether or not they break away with violence or whether or not they assume some sort of protectorate status under the, uh, which is an existing concept under the UN Charter, which the Outer Space Treaty incorporates, um, or whether or not we see some additional protocol, I just cannot imagine that the natural tendencies and rights of human beings to govern themselves and to own property will not become preeminent over, uh, you know, over concerns that no piece of a celestial body can be part of a nation state. You mentioned Dan Dudney. I'm, I'm uh, reading his book because uh, at the uh, International Space Development Conference about a month from now, uh, which is sponsored by the National Space Society, everyone's welcome to, to uh, participate in that. Uh, we will actually have a debate between Dan Dudney, Dan Dudney, the uh, the uh, moderator, or, I'm sorry, the the author of this book, and uh, Mark Hopkins, who's a prior uh, chair of the executive committee, CEO of the National Space Society, and I will be moderating that, so I need to read the book. Um, see, I I'm guessing the, the answers to this will be short, considering some prior answers. Um, when large settlements and their governments are established in space. Does the Space Force expect to interact with them or has it even thought about that? I kind of guess not. <laughs> well, well I, oh, go ahead. all right. So, uh, well, if you look at the, uh, whether they have thought about it, well, as, as I say, the Space Force uh, has so many different uh, 
uh, components, right? And so one of the documents that Peter talked about, which is looking at the world in 2060, which actually came out of the US uh, Space Command in, through a workshop called the Space Futures Workshop. Actually, if you look at the document, it's available online, and I think your audience might find it interesting. Uh, they, do, they do deal with a uh, future where you might have large habitation and the Space Force actually has interactions with them. Uh, in terms of that kind of uh, situation. Now, whether this is official policy, because this is an academic study uh, that was uh, basically supported by the you know, Space Futures Workshop, uh, especially Dr. Joel Moser, who's the chief scientist of the Space Force, has an interest in understanding that kind of world and what, what strategic role can the Space Force play. Um, so there is thinking. There is actually thinking within the Space Force for that kind of uh, a future. Now, the larger, deeper strategic question is whether the thinking will now. So the so one thing, Anita, is that in our book, what we do is we study with how epistemic community conversations, for example, the National Space Society, which is an epistemic community that talks about humanity expanding uh, into the universe. Now, that is at the intellectual epistemological level. By epistemological, I mean at the level of uh, influence in terms of ideas. Now, when does that translate into policy? And once that translates into policy, how does it get implemented and who implements it? So in that context, the, that particular method is, I think, critical to understand how the Space Force thinking is on this as well. You have the thinking that that is the possibility, but whether that has translated to policy and then there is a real time implementation mechanism going on. I don't know. Peter might have something to add. So, so you know, I, I would say that right now the percent of the Space Force's brain thinking about this is very small, but it's not zero. Um, so, for instance, you know, when I presided over the Space Horizons Task Force, I had students that were thinking about, you know, how they might retake a space colony or how they would do a forced boarding of a space colony. Uh, you know, what, what you would do, you know, how you would minimize, uh, you know, debris. You know, I suspect, you know, that, you know, a, a space colony, you know, would, would be treated a lot like, I think, uh, an island or an overseas, you know, colony in that you know you would be expected to protect and serve it as long as it is on your side and of course if it's trying to get away without due process i'm sure nations would behave every bit as badly as the britain did against its colonies um uh and i'm sure that if they was the uh you know the other guys space colonies that we'd behave as opportunistically as uh, as France behaved or as we behaved, you know, when Panama uh, broke off in order to have the Panama Canal. So, you know, I think, you know, how the Space Force will interact will be governed by what are perceived to be the interests of the, of whatever nation that owns that particular Space Force at the time. And at least in the United States, a lot of those interests tend to be, you know, liberal human rights, open trading interests, so I wouldn't expect that our space force is going to be a draconian space force. It would be very much like the United States Navy, pretty much protecting the safety for everybody who's not trying to turn it into their own private economic empire. Okay. Uh, up until now, space stations have been launched and operated by national government entities. In the future, we expect economic activity in space to occur between commercial and private entities. What do you see as the future of national government operation operated facilities in space? Well, um, I, you know, first of all, I think, you know, this, this trend is going to happen first in the United States. And, you know, uh, Namrata can tell you all about, you know, what other nations are doing that will be national space stations. But, you know, I'll speak on the United States side and let her, her cover the international scene. Um, you know, I think you're going to see a desire to, uh, you know, have commercial space stations in low Earth orbit. Uh, 
I think it might be you know, very similar to how we run our national labs where some part may be government owned, contractor operated, or it might be contractor owned, you know, government operated, or you know, there's just any number of different things that you could do. Um, but there will be some things, and those might be military things, that are, are going to be uh, facilities that will be considered national, and they will either be, you know, they, they might be operated by a private entity, but they're of such national importance, like say a strategic propellant reserve, or let's say a strategic mineral reserve, um, or something that, you know, protects the lines of commerce at uh, the Earth Moon Lagrange point one at EML one. Uh, you know, there will still be a need for government operated. Uh, locations. Now, whether or not those are manned or unmanned at the time, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, when that would come, but in the longest term, you know, governments do operate and sometimes own buildings and facilities and, and they're a minority, right? I mean, I, I haven't looked at the figures, but, you know, in general, the military is about somewhere on the order of 3.5% of GDP, you know? So, you know, you could expect that if space were to work its way out in the, the grand way that the NSS sees, you know, maybe, you know, three out of every hundred facilities might belong to the US, uh, you know, government or military, maybe more. I mean, government is actually more like 30% of GDP, um, but they don't own most of the buildings they occupy. You know, they, they lease a lot of them. So it'll it'll probably, you'll, you'll probably see every potential model that you see on earth and perhaps a few more. Okay. Yeah, I'll add to Peter and say that uh, I think the US leads in this particular area of commercialization of a space station, for example. I think recently Axiom Lab uh, has part is participating in the construction of a commercial space station. Uh, if you look at uh, China, for example, China has, of course, launched the first module of its national space station, uh, the Tianghe, which is going to become the only space station uh, by 2030. Uh, the permanent, it's a permanent space station in low Earth orbit if the ISS is not funded. We do know that Russia has already started uh, saying that it will retreat from the International Space Station by 2030 and establish its own space station. It's because of not just uh, international dispute, but actually the real reason is because uh, there have been problems with the Russian uh, you know, uh, side of the International Space Station. And so, the, uh, so, and so in that context, what I see is that you will have uh, a US that will be having more commercialization of space stations, but on the other side, you will have uh, China, Russia that will actually we have very nationalistic space stations. Now I'll qualify that by saying that in the recent years, not Russia, but China has actually started commercialization of its space activities as well. So in 2014, uh, the State Council, which is the largest policy making body in China, issued a document, which is very interesting. It's called document 60. In that document, President Xi Jinping uh, directed almost all Chinese space startups to start investing in commercialization and by offering subsidies, including subsidies in launch, uh, directing money to uh, made in China policy, uh, and also uh, encouraging space startups to invest in technologies like space launch reusability, which is a key core area, and also in terms of their own participation in Chinese space station. So you could see a trend towards commercialization because of the, as I mentioned, space is being seen as a very important domain for economic return of investment. And so I see a future where other countries will also follow suit. Okay. We space advocates all want to believe that people who move into space will behave more logically than people on earth. On the other hand, history shows that humanity breeds criminals. Does the Space Force anticipate getting involved with issues that are normally addressed on Earth by police and sheriffs? So, you know, again, this goes to the cultural divide of who, who's thinking about it. You know, obviously, 
folks on, on my side of the camp, on the Blue School, have been thinking about this a lot and even wrote legislation giving it that authority. Um, but, uh, but that was not included in the, in the actual constitutive legislation. And I, I, I don't think that uh, this uh, occupies a lot of thought of the current uh, Space Force leadership, nor do I think they you know, want or would welcome that. I think they would prefer a constrained set of you know, things to be you know, working on. Uh, and I think they would very much, you know, like to point and say that's that's not my job. That should be somebody else's job. But as I've pointed out before, the, the problem with that is it it may be somebody else's job, but nobody else has got the actual equipment and expertise to to do anything about it. Now that could change. You know, you might be able to deputize a, a you know a commercial asset that's got rendezvous proximity, you know, and robotic arm ops or something, or you might. You know, you might eventually choose to fly, you know, uh, you know, like we have air marshals, you know, space marshals, or we might employ and deputize people on, you know, space stations, uh, you know, but there will always be situations where whatever that civilian capacity is gets overwhelmed and, you know, the folks with the, with the significant, you know, capabilities, which on earth tend to be you know, logistics, medical use of actual force, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Um, you, people come to the military when they get uh, overwhelmed. And so I find it, you know, you have to sort of put yourself in, in the thought experiment. Let's say that we have, you know, in a few years, Axiom has their own space station. And let's say that a very high net worth individual who is, uh, who is a donor to whoever the president of at that time is, is threatened by some individual who's out of control and needs to be apprehended and taken down, you know, or let's say that they get, you know, uh, terribly sick and need to be moved directly to earth. I, I find it impossible to think that the president isn't at some point in time going to turn to a space force commander and say, can you do something about that? And if you can't, why not? you know, what am I funding your budget for, you know, if you can't be relevant and help me? And it's a natural tendency of bureaucracies to want to be relevant and to, and to want to be used and seen in a good light. So I, I think whether or not they want it, it's coming for them. You know, they may not be interested in law enforcement. Law enforcement is interested in them. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I would say that your question is actually, uh, interesting and tricky because if you think about the Space Force uh, interacting with say a particular settlement, right? It'll depend on which country, first of all, that particular settlement draws from. Uh, for law enforcement, uh, it's easier if it is an American company or American citizens, but then it's also difficult because law enforcement is not usually the job that the military does in the US it's more a police function. And, and so in that context, the way the services are legally uh, established, uh, I don't think they have law enforcement capability within the United States, but they do engage in foreign internal defense, which is a very different uh, activity. So, uh, and so that's why your question is, there are two parts to your question. One is that, Will the Space Force play the role of a law enforcement entity if it is American companies? As Peter mentioned, they might be the only service that's actually able to go and uh, address rogue behavior or violent behavior because they have the means to do that. Uh, and also because this is extraterrestrial outside of the US sovereign territory, as, as if I may, because after all the Outer Space Treaty tells you you cannot establish sovereignty in another celestial body. But the second part to your question is, what if that particular settlement is not American and it's foreign? Uh, who then has law enforcement capability? Uh, is, is, it's not yet clear. Let me, let me give you a couple of other scenarios that I think you could expect the Space Force to become involved, right? So one is a simple act of piracy that you could see today. You know, somebody could take a very small satellite, you know, maybe just bigger than a CubeSat, 
and park it next to somebody's satellite, you know, when they're broadcasting the Super Bowl and jam it. And, you know, and maybe, you know, you know, threaten, you know, that if, uh, if they did anything about it, you know, they might try to crash. Well, you know, who really is likely to have the expertise to do anything about that? You know, I, I think it would be the Space Force. Um, or suppose somebody was doing the same sort of thing, that they were blocking, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Boeing or the Space Force capsule from docking with Axiom because they were stationing, you know, CubeSat or SmallSat in the, in the way, you know, you would have to be able to call on somebody to remove that type of uh, coercion. But you could also imagine, you know, that somebody might, uh, like, it wouldn't be okay with us if somebody, even if they were foreign, some company were experimenting with, you know, with something biological or, nan you know, nanotech dangerous and, you know, could potentially, I mean, we, we were even, you know, clearly thinking about whether or not we needed to take action if the Chinese rocket was going, rocket body was going to re-enter, you know, and hurt people in the United States. Well, similarly, you know, if there was some type of dangerous contraband, you know, it, it might be called, you know, that. And then, of course, you could imagine on the high end, you know, suppose uh, somebody uh, misapprehends, you know, like, uh, I, I believe Namrata mentioned the fact that China is planning to try to bring a small asteroid back to Earth. Well, suppose they were to miscalculate, or suppose one of their companies 50 years from now was going to miscalculate, or one of ours was going to miscalculate, and it was going to hit a city. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, whatever the law problems are, it, we, the, the Outer Space Treaty, you know, incorporates the UN Charter, which incorporates self-defense. So we would do, the, the Space Force would be called to do things that would be perceived as self-defense against, you know, criminal or mistaken or irresponsible acts. Okay, there's another one I was going to ask, I'm going to skip, uh, partly in the interest of time. Um, we, we don't want to think about this, but having a military branch associated with space begs the question, what would cause war to break out in space? Mammy, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can talk about one scenario where there could be the possibility of a war breaking out. So one could be, since you asked this question before about, say, the moon, and then you have the south pole of the moon, which is one of the areas which is rich in resources. So you have, say, for the case of uh, a hypothetical scenario, uh, you have a Chinese company that has gone and established uh, its base there and now has established a zone of non-interference, very similar to what China has done in the South China Sea, where it has unilaterally established a zone of non-interference and disputed countries are not allowed to come in and are threatened, uh, including by Chinese uh, militia. And so in that context, take, take for example, that is the area where you have water ice and you have the other resources you need to establish and sustain a human settlement. Uh, think of in that context, you have an American company that also wants to land in that area, but is denied that right. I can see a dispute breaking out over that. And, and that's something that I think about in terms of my strategic uh, future, uh, you know, gaming. Peter? Yes, so I, I basically see uh, two scenarios and I'll post in the chat, uh, you know, my thoughts about that. But the principal scenario that animates Space Force thinking and planning today is that you would have an, an earthbound conflict where uh, two powers, you know, say, you know, the US and China uh, or say, you know, Japan, one of our treaty allies and China, um, you know, in the South China Sea or North China Sea or, you know, Taiwan. And, uh, and our adversary wanted to prevent, uh, and we were coming to the rescue in terms of trying to exert, you know, counter intervention, you know, uh, you know trying to stop, uh, trying to intervene to stop what, what they were doing, 
to our allies' uh, needs. Well, in that case, China would have would be incentivized to take out our eyes, ears, and communication, and our precision navigation and timing. So, you know, today we are a very capable force, you know, far away from the United States. But if suddenly our ships can't communicate over the horizon, if our bombs are, you know, a hundred times less accurate, you know, if we don't know where we are on the open ocean, if we can't see through the clouds and weather, if we can't see what's moving, you know, we are a hundred times, maybe more, you know, less effective than we would be with space. So an adversary has a really, really strong incentive to poke out our eyes and ears and communication channels in space. And so that leads to a rapid escalation. But the second scenario, and so that is terrestrial interests on earth are so severe that they force a, you know, the removal of any space advantage. That's the first scenario for a space war. The second scenario of a space war is that strategic interests in space themselves are the cause. And so here you could imagine, you know, that one power decides to make a land grab on the moon or, or they try to blockade, you know, your, your base on the moon. You know, there are actually fantastic scenarios in the second season of For All Mankind. If, if you haven't watched on Apple TV For All Mankind, there are really terrific examples of how this could kick off. Um, and of course, that could extend, you know, anywhere else. So, you know, that would be the, the two routes to a potential war in space. And what we're talking about today in war in space is not any kind of bombardment from space to Earth. I don't think anybody's talking about that today. Um, you know, what people are talking about is negating either electronically, with cyber, uh, with electronic warfare, or with you know, lasers or microwaves or kinetic ASATs or, you know, robots with arms, you know, negating the other person's satellite capability so that they are not able to make use of space. Let's, uh, let's go to uh, some audience questions. Now this one says Peter's going to answer. This is a, uh, but I'll, it, Looks like it hasn't been answered. So General Daniel Graham presented on U.S. as the High Frontier Plan from the, uh, the late 1980s as part of the Baltic Con Science Track. Do you consider this program, meaning Space Force, as a successor to High Frontier? I absolutely do. Uh, I, I think that the impetus for Space Force, for the folks external that caused it to be, had all read Graham you know, and, and the folks that both influenced him and that he influenced around. And, and you know, High Frontier is something that, you know, everybody at the, at, uh, the, the Schriever Scholars and Space Horizons Task Force has read. I know Namrata has, has read uh, Graham's High Frontier. Uh, and it was really the first to enunciate this whole of nation strategy of both economics and sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a Space Force-like type of uh, you know, a military defense. So al although I will say again, that just because that is, was part of the thinking and the impetus of the people who pressed for the Space Force, I do not think that Graham's thinking is well inculcated into the culture of Air Force Space Command that has grafted over and has become the Space Force. So that is work yet to be done to help indoctrinate them into the true school of space power. Anything to add, Namrata? I think the one thing I would add about Graham, because I just read his book, is that what I found so insightful was that Graham actually uh, highlighted the importance of developing robotic cap capability in the beginning. So before humans actually go to space and settle, he basically thought that the important thing is to first develop that life sustaining system by the use of robots and autonomous you know, uh, robotic capability. Now, what I find, why I say I find that insightful is that because his book was written in the 1980s, and then when you see how China is functioning in its space program, it's very similar. So China's space program is not talking about humans landing on the moon. They are not even prioritizing that. 
They're not talking about sending humans to Mars. They're first developing the capacity that is with the, with the usage, usage of robotic explorers, autonomous you know, decision-making. President Xi is investing a lot in artificial intelligence and 3D printing, and basically the capability to develop autonomous uh, in-space manufacturing so that once you master those, you are then able to send humans for long-term sustainability. And as you were mentioning, the NSS vision of human settlement. And so I think I was having this conversation with my colleagues, including Peter, that Graham's thinking seems to have influenced Chinese thinking on how uh, space is moving forward. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to take one more question from the audience and then we'll allow each of you a little bit of time for closing arguments. We have a little bit more than uh, 10 minutes left here. Um, so from the audience, might uh, space dwelling companies and or groups of people from different US states demand that the laws of their state supersede US or international law? And I'm, I'm trying to think of you know what might those be, um, <clears throat> uh, might have to do with things like liquor laws and stuff like that, I suppose. <laughs> well, that's definitely a new question for me. I have thought about uh, states owning space stations and infrastructure or, or you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, nations that just like they own casinos in the United States, you know, perhaps they could, uh, you know, fund the uh, on orbit casinos. Uh, I think the United States always takes a dim view that anything supersedes federal law. And, and I think, you know, that would get litigated in the courts on earth. Uh, I don't think it'd be decided in, in space. Okay. I think we can move on. I think. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's enable each of you to, to do some closing um, comments. And, and that can include if you want to ask questions of each other and you decide between you who starts. Go ahead, Peter. Well, I, I'd like to answer Marin's uh, question about okay. how relevant are these long-term plans in the face of climate change? You know, look, in my view, the only way out of climate change is through space technology. Um, you know, the, the most hopeful thing is, is space-based solar power. Space solar power, you know, if you take your solar panels, which only get, you know, a 25% you know, duty cycle on earth and are, are sitting in low light or nighttime all the time. If you move them up to geostationary orbit, they collect 11 times as much energy. And even after you convert it to microwaves and reconvert it back, the same piece of land in a temperate place like the United States is gonna collect five to six times as much energy, you know, and have just radically less heating of the biosphere. And space solar power scales to all global demand. If everybody has a US lifestyle six times over and solar power satellites can be built with 99% lunar materials, which is like a millionth of a percent of the mass of the moon. It's just a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, and then, you know, you can also, you know, launch and put, you know, a, uh, uh, a sunshade at Earth, Moon, Lagrange one to ever so slightly moderate, you know the uh, the, the climate. Earth, Sun, not Earth, Moon. Sorry, that's right. Sun, Sun, Earth, L one <laughs> point. Uh, you can put a, a swarm there, um, and so you know there are ideas, and there of course you know for anything that you might want, lots of platinum group metals for hydrogen economy or electric battery economy. There's just a tremendous amount of things up in space. Uh, you know, that can help with climate change. So there's nothing in my view as relevant, and I put a link about space solar power in the chat, and I'll put another one for what the Space Force is actually doing about it through the, their research lab uh, than space technology. If we're, if we're truly committed to solving climate change, the route is through space development. Uh, do you have any closing statements, Peter? All right, I guess I would just say that when we talk about space power and the Space Force, um, you have to realize that you as the audience have agency, that you know, as 
folks who have a voice, you have a voice in what sort of space force you want your space force to become. You know, and if you want to see a more Starfleet like Space Force that has a broad mandate, you know, you can write to your congressman, you know, you can circulate these ideas among other people. And I think they matter. They matter to the future of humanity, uh, whether or not we're able to defend planet Earth, whether or not we're in a position to make sure that uh, people who settle other worlds or free flying space colonies enjoy the political liberties that we consider important in the United States, that if you want a future of liberty and open trade where all of humanity can make use of that vast resource, you, you want to have something like a Space Force that like the US Navy protects commerce on the great black ocean uh, you know, above and out beyond. So you know, my first message to take away is the fact that we have a space force is a good thing for the United States, for all of humanity, for the future of freedom, but that the, the battle for the soul of the space force has not yet been decided. And you can play a role in making sure that it goes in the right direction and doesn't turn its back on sci-fi, but embraces the vast policy potential that sci-fi has already explored. Okay, so um, I'm going to make three points in terms of my closing statement. First, uh, I think I want to reiterate, and I don't think this is discussed as much in the in the public social media social media or popular media, and that is that uh, the context of space has changed today, and I think that's something that we really need to understand. It's no more the Cold War where you are very happy with symbolic missions but you do not really think about how those missions are actually establishing a particular nation's spacefaring capacity or a long-term settlement goal. So that's number one. Uh, so we need to move beyond just symbolic missions of space science or space exploration to act and add, as that as the end goal to seeing how that can actually lead to further development of human capacity in space. I think the second point that I would like to say is that the Space Force in particular uh, should have both uh, visions. One is that, as Peter was mentioning, a vision that looks at how can it uh, support US policy of sustainable presence? What should its role be uh, to include rescue missions, humanitarian missions uh, beyond just military, which almost all the services do, including the US Navy, when it comes to a tsunami, for example. Uh, and the second important vision is that how can it support joint function? So it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. It, I think it has to be a grand strategic thinking. The final point I would like to make is that because of my first point, that the nature of space has changed and you have several new countries that have established space agencies, this is the right time for the United States to explain to the world, why is it going to space? What is the end goal of the US taxpayers funding their space program? And I think that is why a visionary speech coming out of President Biden is really important, like you had the famous John F. Kennedy speech, which inspired my father, who was an Indian citizen, you know? And so it's very important, I think, to, to have that kind of explanation as to why space is important at the level of leadership. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So uh, let's see, looking at the questions, um, I'm getting messages, pardon me, vintage. Uh, after the panel, be sure to check out the Balticon social spaces. By the way, I'd, I'd very much like to thank the Balticon conference organizers for asking us from the National Space Society to, to handle this topic and, and do this, um, this panel discussion. I want to thank the, the panelists. Uh, great interaction. Uh, I truly enjoyed your, your answers and insights. And I think we, uh, we actually ended up addressing some things that really haven't been out in the literature out in the wild much. So thank you very much. And uh, let's see, so I'm gonna ask, uh, after the panel, be sure to check out the Balticon social spaces. There's a Discord chat server. Okay, this is in the Q and A, there's, a, there's an address there. Uh, Gather Town, there's another link there. You can find Merchant Spaces, as well as our Artist Alley. Alley. 
socialize with other attendees and take part in, in various activities. Um, let's see, after panel discussions about this panel, you can go to the Discord ch server channel. Um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your virtual Balticon experiences. Uh, let's see, we've got five minutes re remaining. Um, so I think we have four minutes re remaining by, by my clock. Um, if we don't have any, uh, I don't see any further questions or any further comments, uh, thank you all very much. We'll, we'll give you another four minutes, <laughs> four minutes back. Um, and uh, thank you, it was fun. I hope to do this again. And we're hoping that conferences next year can be in person. We're really looking forward to that. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for. Well, they wanted us to put in the uh, oh the uh, uh, link for ISDC here. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, ISDC is International Space Development Conference. It's uh, sponsored by National Space Society. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>